I'm Professor Michael Hume uh, from Lancaster University, uh, where I uh, sit in the Institute of Advanced Studies. My main subject area is the socialisation of technology. I'm interested in how technologies are used and how people behave with technologies. The internet is fundamental to a, a particular group of young people. And by young people, I'm, I'm really talking about those, should we say, below their mid-twenties. They're often called M-agers or digital natives. For this group, I would argue that they, they live what I've called hybrid lives. In other words, the virtual, the internet world, is completely enmeshed in the physical world. So they're one and the same. Where the internet is most important to uh, this group is not just for gathering information, but it is indeed their first source of information, but it's actually for the way they construct and build conversations. This group are building very complex conversations which consist of not just, if you like, vocal words or text, but they involve video, music, pictures, combinations of given content, contents, contents that are, if you like, are broadcast, that are then mashed up to create particular meanings. I've called these meanings um, elsewhere, uh, hyperglyphs. Um, so that they kind of go together to create very complicated, highly nuanced meanings. And I would argue that in many ways this group have a depth of conversation that is greater than uh, the population that's much older than that group. I think we are in danger of creating a digital divide. I would particularly single out young people here, although uh, older people are of course very very important. The divide though is of course partly related to access but I think access as a word hides the real meaning of division. Because the internet is such an important mode of communication and connection if we have a group that doesn't have access and availability to the internet it effectively means that they are precluded from conversation with greater society. In other words, they can only talk amongst themselves. And this becomes self-perpetuating. We end up with a significant minority group that is effectively ostracised from society. So we, we really need to do something about ensuring that they're fully connected as, as quickly as possible. I think that that's over and above access to information. Access to information is very, very important, but most importantly is that we can all communicate with one another. We hear quite a lot of concerns about time that people might spend on the internet or playing games or virtual worlds, that kind of thing. I don't believe that there is actually such a thing as over-reliance on the internet. Yes, occasionally we may come across one or two individuals who cut themselves off from the world in general and spend all their time in front of their PC or laptop or something like that. But they are a very small minority. And they're the same kind of minority that in the physical world we may find shunning the presence of other people or something like that. We are not dealing with a generation that is losing the ability to communicate, that's losing the ability to mix with others. In fact, all the real evidence shows that the internet is connecting people. It's improving and enhancing communication. It's allowing us to jump barriers of time and space to be with one another, to share events with one another and to be together. So for me, the internet is it's actually just part of life and it's part of life that enriches the physical side of life.
We obviously have to encourage both younger and older people to go online as much as possible. Now we're fortunate in that there are some trends which are going to help us here. Firstly, uh, the internet's becoming mobile. And we know that mobile device is very much the device of young people, irrespective of, of grouping. Um, we also know that the interfaces are getting easier to use. The technology in general is getting more accessible. But how do we encourage people to go back and have a try? Well, often they may have had a try in the past. And I think this is particularly re relevant to the older groups, many of whom may well have been uh, previously involved in computer lessons or uh, opportunities to learn such as that where they've tended to emphasize probably the the technical aspects the hardware aspects of being connected of being engaged well i think now we've moved beyond that we've moved to a, a time when we think in terms of benefits from engagement things that you can get out of uh, using the internet and uh, computers more generally so I, what we've got to try to do is, is to re-encourage people to have another look. And having another look, to me, is all about benefits. If we want to encourage somebody to use a computer, uh, to use video on a computer, you know, let's, let's do it from the basis of keeping in touch with their grandchildren on the other side of the, the, the world or something like that. Um, we know because the data already shows us that um, if we were, for instance, to take texting, Texting began with young people, but moved out into the population, the older population, as they began to realise that texting was a good way of staying in, in touch with the, their kids and their grandchildren as well. And we've got to kind of take that argument and open it up for all. And I think if we do that and we, we lead with the benefits, then we can get a lot of people back to reacquaint themselves and relook at what's available today. In terms of younger people, um, yes, the phone is important, but education's got to be uh, got to really play a, a key role, and there has to be enormous commitment to ensure that the most disadvantaged are find it very able to get the basics of technology that's going to re going to connect them. Okay. What? internet access and the new access opportunities and, and networking opportunities through social networks, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, really begin to give us the, the opportunity to do is to engage in issues, the political process, nationally, locally and, and, in, uh, and in fact multinationally as well. Now, just having the opportunity to engage is not sufficient. Um, it's fundamental change in the nature of engagement that's required as well. One of the key aspects of behaviour, particularly when we look at the, the digital native group, is a desire to have feedback. Um, I talk at, at great length about feedback loops and verification. And what I mean by that is if I'm going to engage in something, if I'm going to put something into something, I want something back. So it, it's, it's, it's fine to say we should have more people engaged in the democratic process say, or around issues. I'm, I'm sure we can get that. I'm sure that that will happen, provided that the process itself becomes interactive and that people believe that by engaging, something will come out of it. That's not at a, an individual level necessarily, it, it, it's probably at, at a level of groups where we, we believe that our views resonate with other people and that through building pressure through other people things can change and, and, and be changed and happen. Now that asks some really big questions about um, how we manage many of our democratic processes. It also asks some rather interesting questions about the speed of reaction as well. Our institutions are geared up to operate in much longer time spans in terms of interaction. We're facing a future where we become increasingly used to almost real-time interaction. 
Now, we obviously don't want one rule, and we don't want um, to be holding effectively a continual uh, referenda, one after the other, about every single issue. And I don't think that that's what's required, but I think what is required is a genuine role for engagement within policy, such that people believe that opinions, views matter. One of the things I think we've got to be very careful of is that the, when we look at the internet, we, we see, are we merely continuing physical life and the boundaries and structures that we, we may see in physical life, from geographic structures to the social structures, etc., or is there something else going on? Certainly at the level of connections, um, at one level, if we look at, um, say, Facebook connections, they actually tend to reinforce physical connections. The majority of traffic is actually between people that we, we know fairly well. But around the fringes, there are lots of indications that we um, move out of our bounded area and begin to move into new places. So the mass may be pretty reinforcing, if you like, but around the peripheral, periphery, we're beginning to push back and push further. And I think that that's quite a, a heartening move, and I'd expect to see more of that in the, in the future. Um, I think we also uh, need to think about different social opportunities that uh, the internet is giving, giving us. I mean, we, we've all heard lots of stories about virtual worlds and avatars and the ability to, to role play and um, take on different personas. I do think we're going to see more of that in the future. I do think we're going to see a slightly more experimental attitude towards the notion of individuality. Um, and that, in a way, may carry some dangers with it, but also carries lots of opportunities. Uh, opportunities for us to put ourselves in different situations than we would in the physical world, uh, possibly to meet different people, uh, and to broaden and, and deepen our experiences. So I wouldn't say that the internet is without risks by any means, but on balance, the opportunity to break down some of the social barriers, some of the ge geographic barriers, and time and cost barriers associated with global connection are such that I would say that overall the internet is moving us forward towards a more connected and I'd like to think slightly more experimental uh, notion of individuality. Well, I'm, I'm convinced that um, years from now we'll look back and, and define the age we, we live in today as the kind of steam age of the internet, if you like. And you may you kind of wonder, what, what do I mean by that? Well, to some degree, by steam age, I mean it's the age in which most of what happens, happens because we manually intervene. If you like, we have to put the coal in the engine to make it work. The world we're about to embrace is one where increasingly more and more happens without our direct personal intervention. So the individual becomes connected, is already connected, to an enormous web of information and communication exchanges. But in the future, that the ordering and the activity of that web will not depend on us physically intervening, starting each conversation, seeking out each item of information. Rather, more of it will come to us, and more of it will be handled by intelligence that itself becomes part of us. Uh, a lot's spoken about uh, young people and their attitudes towards privacy, and often in the context of some of the dangers of um, being online. Um, it, is, it is a challenging and difficult area, 
there is no doubt that in order to be engaged in conversations um, and connected, quite often there's a need to give quite a lot of personal information. Overall, most young people quite knowingly make the decision to give the personal information so that they can be engaged. Giving that information obviously puts them at a degree of risk, although our research found that for most people they believe that these are risks that they can manage. They think they're sufficiently aware to, to manage those risks. And I think we have to be very careful when we talk about that, that we draw some distinction between younger, very much younger adults, children, uh, and then we've got the kind of grey area around the 16, 17 year olds, and then we've got a, a group older than that. Certainly children need some degree of protection, there's no doubt about that, and parents need to be very aware of what their children are accessing and need to try to instill, and also schools as well I should say, try to instill the basics of sound behaviour at an early stage. But as the child grows older and grows into uh, adulthood, um, one hopes that carries forward those, uh, that learning with them. You'll have to accept the fact that I think people will always take calculated risks. The need to be engaged is, for most people, stronger than the need to be completely private. And I think in the world that we're moving into, which is a world of connection, you will find that people will continually sacrifice, or at least, if you will like, mortgage their privacy to be involved.